Russian invasion that began almost two weeks ago on February 24th. And the images and videos of the devastation in Ukraine are, are breathtaking. The UN has estimated that more than two million citizens have fled from their homeland while a great many have stayed to defend it. While the world watches, governments have been swift to respond with stringent and unprecedented economic sanctions targeting U Russia and its oligarchs. As we process the violence, we're left with many questions. Why did Russia decide to invade? How will the siege impact the region and beyond? And what toll does this take on the people of Ukraine? Today, we'll hear from a panel of Endicott faculty experts who will shed light on the conflict by answering these questions from their own perspectives. Let's meet them now. First, we have Vitaly Kozarev, Professor of Political Science and International Studies. Dr. Kozarev studies international relations and foreign policy in Eurasia. As Endicott faculty, he has held, he's held fellowships at Harvard University, the East-West Center in Washington, D.C., and the National University of Singapore. He's also affiliated with the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University as an associate in research. Next, Alana Timison, Associate Professor, Political Science and Security Studies. Dr. Timison's research and teachings are focused on conflict, international crimes, and justice in world politics. She's published on the politics of the International Criminal Court and is currently developing a research project on cultural genocide. Next, Lara Salahi, Assistant Professor, Broadcast and Digital Journalism. Dr. Salahi's current work is focused on the life and death consequences of disinformation, what the World Health Organization has deemed as infodemic. She's specifically looking at state-sponsored disinformation, of which the Russian government has been and continues to be a clear leader. And finally, Samaha Abebe, Assistant Professor, International Studies. Dr. Abebe is the author of The Last Post-Cold War Socialist Federation Ethnicity, Ideology, and Democracy in Ethiopia. His research focuses on conflict studies, human rights, international law, and sub-Saharan Africa. To ensure time for all of our panelists and to ensure time for questions, each of our experts will speak for about five minutes. Dr. Kozarov, let's start with you. Can you tell us briefly how the history of the region and relations between Russia and Ukraine have led to this invasion? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it's a sad moment for me um, as uh, someone who actually uh, grew up in the Soviet Union and uh, who has uh, lots of connections with uh, Ukraine. And my mom was uh, Ukrainian and my, um, my father was 90% Ukrainian. So I have a real, uh, and I lived all my life in, uh, in the Soviet Union and Russia in Moscow. So I actually kind of touched on the two sides of the uh, current, uh, you know, encounter between the Ukrainian and the Russian peoples and Ukrainian-Russian political systems and ideo ideologies and values. So I uh, would like to start with uh, my probably support of uh, my colleagues at the Davis Center at Harvard. Uh, recently had uh, some panels and just debates about what is happening and Ukraine and uh, within Ukraine and Russia. And I would love to probably uh, support uh, the statement by the Davis Center, which uh, 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 called the attempt by the Russian president to resolve longstanding grievances with both the Ukrainian government and the post-Cold War international order through violence, is, is, which is a grave mistake. So uh, I would say that probably uh, very uh, briefly that if I just asked my students and asked many, many people in, uh, this, in the Russia, uh, if there was a um, referendum uh, before Putin's decision, I would say, I would assure you that 90%, 95% of the population in Russia would uh, say no to this actually encounter to this war in Ukraine. Uh, I will tell a couple of words. Uh, let me just share with you my uh, thoughts about historical and geopolitical reasons and aspects of this Ukrainian-Russian war, uh, which uh, the Russian, the Putin administration is called military operation. Uh, and it, now it looks like a full-fledged war, full-fledged war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, so shortly uh, on the historical uh, component or historical aspect or perspective of the formation of the Ukrainian statehood. 
uh, for the Russians, official Russian position is that the Ukrainian people is an alienable part of the broader Slavic family, which makes the Ukrainian and Russian uh, people's uh, sister nations, so kind of the sister nations, the same civilizational and social entity, right? So that's the position that which <coughs> actually the Putin himself and his uh, lots of, uh, you know, lieutenants uh, try to deliver and explain and justify the current, uh, current events, current aggress aggression in Ukraine. Uh, <coughs> the Ukrainian narrative actually justifies the development of distinct Ukrainian identity that was formed as early as in the 13th throughout the 15th centuries. So, and if you go and look at the Ukrainian uh, development, of the, the Ukrainian identity, the Ukrainian na nation, <laughs> uh, we could uh, actually <coughs> speak about the uh, specific unique uh, princedoms and traditions uh, aside from the Mongol, uh, Tatar, York, and the rise of the Northern Russia, because Northern Russia was associated with the rise of Moscow, and uh, the Russian uh, narrative uh, actually tries to explain that with the rise of Moscow, Kiev actually lost its, its significance. But the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian historians are trying to, uh, to uh, and they found a lot of evidence that this tradition didn't die, and moreover, there were uh, new principalities, which they called the Kingdom of Ruthenia, uh, in today's uh, central and western Ukraine, which actually um, now in the Galicia Volinia region, and that they represented the venerable and continuity of the Ukrainian st uh, statehood. <coughs> Second uh, part is the 13th century, I uh, would say until the 18th century, when uh, actually the so Russian uh, imperialism actually uh, in incorporated Ukraine and uh, territories into the Russian Empire in uh, by 16, six, 1760. So uh, this uh, relates to the tradition of the so-called Cossacks freedoms because Ukraine, even in Russian, Ukraine is like at the edge that we can translate at the edge, at the edge of the empire. So they always, they actually were placed at the edge of the empire between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Russian Empire. And that's how they actually found themselves, especially in the 17th century, squeezed between the Ottoman, the Turks in the, in the south, the Russians in the, in the east, and the Polish and Lithuanian in the west. And that's how they uh, actually were fighting for their freedom. So that's why they said that uh, it, uh, the, uh, uh, the current narrative says that uh, this was the uh, an attempt by the Ukrainians to develop their anti-colonial and anti-imperial tradition, right? Then we go to the uh, Russification of Ukraine during the, since the 18th century until the February 1917 revolution. And then after February 1917 revolution, the Ukrainian actually, they had their rada, they had their kind of assembly. They declared independence from the uh, new uh, Tsarist Russia and there were negotiations between the uh, provisionary government in, uh, uh, and the Ukrainians uh, so that they would stay at, this, at that point uh, within the, uh, the new kind of uh, political entity. But they already had some intentions to declare independence and move on. And the Soviet Bolsheviks actually seized power in, the, in October 1917. And then uh, Ukraine find uh, out uh, that Ukraine stayed in within the Soviet uh, Union until 1991 when Ukraine on um, in August 24th of 1991 declared independence. Um, uh, I will, I'm, not, I'm not going to uh, elaborate too much on the Soviet period. I have only two things, three things to say. One it was the uh, so-called uh, uh, Great Famine. Great Famine which uh, is associated in Ukraine with the 1932-1933, a huge starvation uh, and famine in Ukraine because of the policy of collectivization by the Stalin administration. And my grandmother was, uh, act they actually, Ukrainian people, hardworking people. So my grandmother actually became kind of rich, uh, kind of, uh, they call rich peasant. And she uh, even bought a tractor by that time. And because she, was, she bought a tractor, she was, uh, it was a decolocization, uh, which is anti-rich peasant campaign. And she, was, she actually, uh, uh, she um, uh, was, uh, di she died of starvation, of like a famine, like she didn't have anything to eat. So that was the, the my own family's impact on this. So go so-called Holodomor, which is the 
uh, big famine was a big, it's, a, it's in the minds of the many Ukrainian population. Uh, the, uh, another thing which I would like to probably uh, remember is that uh, the discrimination of the Ukrainians, and my, I have my own story when I was uh, supposed to receive uh, the Soviet passport, I was 16, and uh, uh, usually passport nationality in the passport was supposed to be indicated after my mother's actually ancestors and my mother's name. So I was supposed to be named there. We had this entry, the nationality, I was supposed to be Ukrainian. And then my father went to the police station, convinced the police uh, to put the Russian there. And I said, Father, I, why are you doing this? He said, because you will have bad career uh, choices, opportunities in uh, Moscow and in Russia. And was, I was so much surprised, it was 1980. So I was much surprised by this, and that's kind of, I remember this very, very well. So I think, uh, and I met, traveled to Ukraine often during the Soviet times, and I stayed uh, my summers with my grandmom uh, in the village. Hardworking people, uh, did they have any hatred toward the Russians? I don't think so. Uh, but they were very much uh, concerned about the, uh, the discrimination and suppression and inequality. Uh, uh, regarding geopolitical roots, uh, I would, uh, uh, to make a long story short, I would say one thing. Uh, uh, it's all about the big contestation and confrontation between the West, the United States and the West and Russia over the, how to interpret the NATO enlargement, eastward enlargement for the, uh, for the West. Uh, the West has been since the mid nineties, uh, considered uh, NATO's enlargement as the uh, development and spread of democracy. Whereas for the Russians, uh, there was a NATO enlargement as the existential threat to the uh, na Russia's national security. So I have some quotes from uh, prominent uh, politi political scientists in the United States, uh, but just to save time, I just, I think that we can, we are welcome to ask questions and especially in terms of interpretation of this existential threat, why Putin responded like this uh, and started his uh, invasion of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Tamison, we hear seeming, seemingly every day on the news that countries are implementing severe sanctions on Russia. To what extent are those sanctions working as a deterrent, and in what other ways are countries responding to the conflict? So I'm going to address sanctions as part of you know, a broad strokes approach to what the international community is doing in response to the war. The international community's response has largely been facilitated through NATO. That's the old Cold War alliance between North American and Western European countries. Ukraine is not a member of NATO, which was originally at the heart of this debate and disagreement. But that means that the Russian attacks on Ukraine do not invoke NATO's Article 5, which is a commitment among its members to defend each other when there's an attack against one, it's viewed as an attack against all. So it, do, it does not invoke that commitment. But NATO countries have successfully remained united in their opposition to Russia and pledged to defend its member countries if Putin's territorial ambitions end up expanding. Russia's aggression has really interestingly prompted some new directions in European foreign policy. Uh, the war has prompted a, quote, revolution in German security and defense policy. This includes a big increase in military spending and a provision of lethal weapons, predominantly missiles, to Ukraine. And this is a really big departure from Germany's post-World War II version of pacifism. And it has the backing of the German public. 69% of Germans believed that Russia's actions in Ukraine would lead to a World War III. So this is a pretty startling new direction for German military policy. Now, in terms of military support, President Zelensky was offered an evacuation by the U.S. Zelensky infamously replied, I need ammunition, not a ride. And that's what he and Ukraine are getting. The U.S. and its NATO allies have pledged not to engage in direct military confrontation with Russia in Ukraine. So the primary means of assistance has been through weapons and cash and technology. In the last week alone, NATO countries have sent 17,000 anti-tank weapons. They've activated cyber missions in order to interfere with Russians' uh, digital attacks and communications. Uh, at the end of February, President Biden included a $350 million in military aid to Ukraine. 70% of that was delivered in just five days alone, so remarkable speed. 
One point of contention, though, in terms of military support has been President Zelensky's request for NATO to implement what's called the no-fly zone over Ukraine. This is considered necessary in order to eliminate Russia's ability to use its best military asset, which is air power. But implementation of a no-fly zone is one thing. Enforcement of it is an entirely different thing, because this would essentially mean NATO countries um, shooting down Russian planes over Ukrainian airspace, and that is just simply not on the table. So to address Dr. Schwartz's question, one of the main parts of the international community's response has been sanctions. Sanctions can be economic or they can be diplomatic. In this case, they are both. And they're popular precisely because they fall somewhere between words and war. In terms of the economic penalties, it's been in the news a lot that Western leaders have frozen the assets of Russia's central bank, which limits its ability to get hundreds of billions of dollars in US currency. Some Russian banks have been removed from what's called the SWIFT messaging system. This enables the smooth transfer of money uh, across borders, although even though this was described by Western powers as kind of the nuclear option in terms of economic sanctions, many doubt that this is actually a serious penalty for Russian banks. And then as many of us know, when we go to the gas station, the US has also just announced a ban on Russian oil and natural gas. They've also been targeting specific individuals, imposing sanctions on a hit list of powerful, wealthy businessmen that are known as oligarchs. President Putin himself, as well as his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, have also been sanctioned. Their assets in the US, EU, Canada, etc., have been frozen. Corporate actors have also stepped up, including PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa, who have all suspended their operations there. But whether sanctions can be effective in a country like Russia, where the regime has almost total control, to be effective, they have to be a threat to Putin's ability to stay in power. So if he can withstand the pressure from both elites and the general population and continue to control the narrative inside Russia, then the sanctions won't work. Two more short points. On crimes, there's undisputed, unsurprising evidence that Russia is committing what are called war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. This is by deliberately targeting civilian areas, including neighborhoods that are dense with residential buildings, hospitals, schools. They've been shelling evacuation routes using illegal indiscriminate weapons like cluster munitions. The International Criminal Court has opened an investigation into this, but we should probably curb our enthusiasm about whether or not any Russian elites or Putin himself would ever sit in the dock, and I'm happy to entertain questions about that. I'll end with a slightly more critical point. The outpouring of support for Ukraine in this condemnation of aggressive war by Russia bring to light the selectivity of the international community's response and their outrage and sympathy. This was considerably more tempered for Syria, for Yemen, for Ethiopia, for the Rohingya and Myanmar. So we either just grew tired of hearing about their suffering or we just ignored them altogether. But that's not to say that the political and the military, the humanitarian response to Ukraine is justified. It, of course, is. Our very fragile international laws are being tested by completely unrestrained power. International stability is at stake. And like many of these types of crises that we've heard about throughout the decades, the ultimate goal is to simply preserve human life. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Dr. Salahi, a lot of attention has been placed on disinformation especially on the part of Russia in both the domestic crackdown on critiques of the government and spinning the narrative through state-owned media. How are you seeing these misinformation campaigns play out in the media and how are they influencing the crisis? Thanks so much, Dr. Schwartz. And uh, Dr. Tainson, I think that perfectly leads into what I'm talking about, which is the importance of controlling the narrative, um, especially inside of Russia, but also the key actors. Um, and so in this conflict, we certainly see uh, violence, we certainly see um, conflict in terms of the warfare, but information war, I think, is, is an incredible um, and critical piece uh, inside of, of this conflict as well. And so I wanna start by first defining what disinformation is, um, and that is um, the, dis the way of using news and information uh, in, in an effort to deceive the public in some way, so false using false information. Um, and so the main goal in, in the disinformation campaigns 
um, that uh, in this case are state sponsored by, by Russia as one of the main actors here, uh, is to further destabilize countries where they have a certain level of interest. So we're certainly seeing this inside of Ukraine, but we're also seeing it here too in the US um, and, and other places as well. Um, and so what are some examples of some of the disinformation tactics that are being used? Um, and these are intricate and enhanced over time. And so um, these are not just planting false stories um, and having a one and done sort of circulating around social media or uh, in other digital uh, news outlets. Um, this is the full-fledged creation of news outlets, um, of startups. Um, and one thing that we've seen recently is sort of passing off uh, AI-generated people um, who spread uh, misinformation within Ukraine. So we saw a case of um, bloggers who look like people who exist and they have full personas. Um, in fact, I can tell you a lot about them. Um, I can tell you that one is a person who apparently was in the aviation industry until the aviation infrastructure system in Ukraine collapsed and then decided to become a journalist. Um, and then, you know, his coworker, before becoming editor in chief of this particular news outlet, um, was a private guitar instructor. And so they come with full fledged personas, um, and you see images of them, um, but they don't exist. They're fully, these people have never existed before. Um, and so uh, that's one, you know, uh, uh, disinformation tactic. Another that's being used that's really interesting is when we think about fake news, um, journalists um, are fact checkers. And so there are entire stories that are made to fact check fake news. Um, and so the reverse is actually happening, um, that uh, you know, the state-sponsored disinformation campaign is debunking actual real stories, so as if they were fake. Um, and so there's a role reversal there too. Um, and then of course we're seeing, um, as in, in every you know, sort of crisis or conflict or breaking news situation, manipulated images, recycled images um, from video games um, and, and past conflicts and passing them off as if they're actually occurring. Um, and it wouldn't be as successful, I'd say, if it was a newly formed strategy. Um, in fact, this dates back to uh, as early as the 1950s. Um, we saw in the 1950s, uh, the USSR formed uh, the Union of Journalists, which was housed under the Communist Party's propaganda department. And one of the, um, one of the missions was to uh, invite journalists, foreign journalists, to come into um, the Soviet Union and see, wine and dine them, and see how uh, amazing you know, life is there, and then go back and write great stories, right? And so um, that seemed to have worked, but then they realized that there's only so far in which you can manipulate journalists, um, and so we've got to create our own. And so in the 1960s, they launched newspapers uh, around the world in which they could plant their own stories. Um, and then uh, something that I'm studying now is one of the first large-scale health disinformation campaigns um, known as Operation Denver in 1983, and that was an entire campaign um, where they planted a fake uh, editorial inside of a newspaper that was launched in India, um, basically saying that HIV was a virus that had, was leaked from a lab, a military lab um, in Fort Detrick, Maryland, um, and so it was a totally concocted, uh, you know, sort of a bioweapon that the U.S. was using, um, and it happened to leak, and so we caused the epidemic. Um, and so, uh, you know, and that really took off. It's, that was planted in uh, newspapers in 80 countries around the world, so, uh, which this was pre-internet. So you can only imagine uh, what life is like now and how quickly uh, information spreads. But I would also say that the information warfare goes beyond these sort of deceptive disinformation campaigns. Um, Russia's now uh, outlawed publishing information on, uh, on the military that the Kremlin deems as false uh, information, whether that's through social media posts uh, or reporting on independent news. So one of Russia's um, remaining independent newspapers that has long been critical of the Russian government has now deleted their war coverage. Um, news outlets like the New York Times, CNN, BBC, ABC, CBS, Bloomberg have now pulled their journalists out of Russia. 
Um, the Washington Post is eliminating bylines. They're going to stay, but they're eliminating bylines from stories to protect their journalists that are now based in Russia. So very clearly Russia is um, in some ways winning uh, the information war inside of its own country. Um, and without the ability of journalists to do their job inside of the country, um, we're seeing critical pieces of the story that's missing. And so much of what we're seeing is news framing, and I'm happy to talk more about it, inside of Ukraine rather than the conflict uh, uh, where Russia is sort of taking uh, head. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Abebe, we've all seen devastating images of refugees fleeing Ukraine and heard reports of Russia not honoring ceasefire agreements or providing adequate routes away from the fighting for civilians. Can you tell us about your experience and what these refugees might be facing? Thank you. Uh, uh, due to the, <coughs> the, the war, uh, there is now uh, <coughs> humanitarian crisis. Uh, according to the United Nations, uh, 474 uh, civilians have been killed and also uh, 861 uh, have been injured uh, because there is uh, indiscriminate attack on uh, civilian uh, areas and also those towns and the cities where the war is going on, uh, millions of uh, civilians have been uh, without any access to basic needs, water, food, and other uh, basic necessities. So because of this, uh, <coughs> the last two weeks, Two million people have already fled uh, Ukraine. Uh, in addition to that, the United Nations uh, Refugee Organization says that there are more than one million internally displaced people. Even the number could be uh, more uh, higher. So uh, as a refugee myself, uh, I can see how uh, it is a very uh, serious, uh, really, uh, challenge for uh, millions of uh, civilians. Uh, and. The next few weeks, it could be more than maybe 4 million and uh, uh, even more. So it could be uh, the, one of the, the most serious uh, refugee crises, uh, I think some uh, commentators say after the Second World War, particularly uh, in Europe. So uh, what is really some of really the trauma and challenges uh, these families and people uh, are passing through? Because uh, basically, um, how the, the, the first question will be how can they make themselves and their families safe uh, in that kind of uh, situation uh, it's very difficult to escape from from uh, from the conflict and there is war going on so i think basically that's the most important uh, very serious challenge for families because most of them are women and children who are being um, affected and also uh, some of the people have been uh, killed while they are evacuating from uh, these, these, these towns. Uh, so I think that's one of the challenges. The other will be, I think, the psychological trauma they, are fa they will face because uh, suddenly these people are forced to leave uh, their, own, their own family, their home, uh, their life. So I, I know how that's really very uh, hard, very uh, disappointing and uh, very sad for, for the people uh, because um, what will be the future for, for these people? It's very difficult to predict. Will they come back to their home or when, when, when this happens? So these kind of uh, uncertainties are very difficult for uh, a refugee because uh, there is no any hope um, uh, to see. Uh, the other is um, really, fortunately, I think, in terms of compared to other refugee crises we witnessed in the last many years, I think there is, um, a well, uh, really a uh, warm welcome of the refugees uh, into the neighboring countries, I think. So uh, this gives the people really um, much hope, uh, at least for temporarily, because at least people are uh, receiving them, accepting them, supporting them, and that's really very important. And uh, for some time, this gives them the hope. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, unless the conflict is uh, addressed or resolved, uh, this will not really uh, fix or uh, bring, bring back the, the, their life. Uh, particularly some of the uh, policy uh, measures taken by like the European Union, which is a very unprecedented measure, uh, 
uh, European Union has decided that um, Ukrainians could live in Europe uh, for three years without any uh, refugee application process because uh, the refugee application process is very stringent, uh, very difficult, and I think this is a very important step uh, for uh, the, the refugees. And also, I think today the UK also decided to accept uh, Ukrainians without any uh, visa. And also, when you see the global media attention and support, I think that's also uh, very, very helpful. Uh, but I think um, since I've been studying this, <laughs> okay, this um, refugee crisis around the world, usually when there is significant media attention, there is a more focus on supporting refugees. Imagine before a few months, there has been a significant focus on Afghanistan. But once the news fed from the main media, it's forgotten. So I think uh, the problem for these refugees will be they could be forgotten if some breaking news happens in the United States or elsewhere, they'll be forgotten. So I think this kind of attention and response should continue until they are back to their, their home. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. So important to understand the history, what's led up to this, how the sanctions are impacting us, how the disinformation is really making an impact and how those who are in this country and need to flee are feeling at this time. So now we're able to open this up to questions. Um, if any of you do have questions, we ask you to raise your hand. We have a microphone to pass to you because we do have those who are joining us virtually. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. And who's passing that mic? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Please do. I'm John Fisk. I teach English 112, and my class is up here somewhere. And I, I'd like to uh, put this out to the panelists. What role, uh, we've seen young people have a role in uh, revolutions uh, throughout history. What kind of role could young people um, have in the forthcoming who knows what happens in Ukraine as time goes on? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think that um, the, uh, since 2014, when there was the Maidan revolution, uh, young people played a tremendously important role because they uh, probably didn't have uh, so many like, you know, connections with the previous eras and they could, couldn't, um, you know, appreciate uh, some achievements of the Soviet Union, but they also, they felt that something in, mod in the process of modernization of Ukraine since 1991 uh, actually had been wrong. So there was not enough because Ukraine was so much, so somehow like stayed for a long time within the kind of, um, the, uh, under the Russian influence and the Russians unfortunately could not uh, extrapolate or, or sell any uh, efficient, model of economic modernization or governance to Ukraine and actually other, the other former Soviet republics. That's why the young people absolutely was, was uh, they were de uh, devastated and they were like uh, unhappy. And that's why there was the justification and they were calling for the Europeanization of Ukraine. So I think that young people represents, represent the, uh, the new uh, new identity where Ukraine is willing to become part of Europe and share European values. Anyone else to respond to that? Okay, we'll go to our next question. Hi, my name is Gwyneth McKinney. I'm a resident, lives down the street a ways. Um, so many questions I'd love to ask, but I'll stick with history for a little bit. Could you talk a little bit about the contrast between say how Russia doesn't tend to have as much of a revolutionary experience with religion as compared to Ukraine. So in thinking about the historical context of um, arguing against the power that's ruling them, um, you know, the, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church never had a revolution in Russia, but was there more of a Protestant revolution that brought in um, more conflict with 
you know, the ruling party as opposed to Russia? We'll answer. <coughs> okay, yes. Uh, actually, in Russia, there were some uh, conflicts and splits within the Russian Orthodox Church uh, over the history. Uh, in the 17th century, we had lots of kind of opposition within the Orthodox Church. Uh, the Ukrainian, uh, you know, their own uh, kind of, um, I would say, cohort of the uh, the most the most kind of you know prominent advocates of the Ukrainian specific uh, branch of the Orthodox Church was based on the it was a special academy uh, in the in the Ukraine, uh, and actually together it was the academy was uh, was named after Mogilov. So Mogilov was uh, now this uh, one one of the cities in Belarus. So <laughs> I thought that was a. Ukraine was split between the Russian Orthodox Church influence and then they were all, they tried to develop their own kind of branch, same as we had in the U Armenia, Armenia and Georgia. Also they are Christian, but they have their own small, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, con confession, uh, confession, uh, confession, uh, you know, uh, diaspora, I would say. So, and everybody respects and nobody doubts that, uh, you know, Georgian or Armenians are not Christian in Russia. But uh, there was a uh, lot of resentment against the uh, separation of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, let alone the uh, influence of the Polish and Catholic Church in, and some of the parts of the population, especially Western Ukraine. So it's a huge, it's a big question, and it's uh, uh, in Russia everything is po being politicized. So yeah, they're developing their own, but I believe that it's part of also the the identity forming effort. Next, next question, Brian. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, so my name is Brian Cordemanch. I work here at the library here at Endicott College. And my question is, um, are nuclear weapons the elephant in the room? Um, I remember Desert Storm when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and we, everybody was outraged and there was a big, you know, multinational effort to shut him down. And, and then when the Taliban, you know, when America was attacked and Taliban were in Afghanistan, everybody was outraged and in and, and we went. So now though, it's, it's Russia, a fully armed, nuclear armed power that's in invading Ukraine and there's all this outrage. Um, but I guess I'm wondering what part do nuclear weapons play? Uh, you know, we're, they're throwing down sanctions and we're voicing all this outrage, but at some point, if it keeps going, like I guess what, what part do, we, we know that Russia, like the United States and other Western powers, we all have nukes. So uh, is that kind of the big monster in the room that scares everybody from taking ultimate action against today it's Russia, another time it could be another country. What part do those weapons play as we look at what is happening right now in Russia but could happen in other parts of the world? I can take that somewhat reluctantly. Um, so the answer is uh, we hope not, but you know, the specter of nuclear war is always there when major powers fight because there's a select few states in this world that still maintain those capabilities and this is one of those few conflicts where, you know, two of those states are at odds with each other. Um, there was a lot of media attention when Russia announced um, a while back that it was putting some of its weapons on high alert. Uh, this was more alarming than it actually is given that many of its weapons facilities are always on high alert as are some of the United States weapons facilities. Um, so that, to a certain extent, is standard operating procedure. Um, it's also not unusual for President Putin to use this type of threat and bluster as a means of um, deterring further sanctions or also, you know, thinking about the audience for those threats. It's not just politicians, it's also citizens in Western European American countries who will hear those things and then have less support for any kind of military engagement um, with Russia in Ukraine specifically. Um, as always, we hope that nuclear weapons are only used as deterrents and not as offensive weapons. Um, but I think uh, a lot of what Putin's threat was was typical bluster. Um, but like I said at the start, you know, the specter is always there so long as those nine states still maintain those weapons. Um, we have a question from the live stream. Uh, this 
Hi, I'm right here. <laughs> this is for Anth uh, this is Anthony. This is for uh, Lara. Um, there on the news last night, uh, there was reference to uh, Putin as a dictator as opposed to president of uh, Russia. Uh, how, can you kind of weigh in on that rhetoric changing on the American news stations as we are referencing um, Putin and how that might um, play out in, in this conflict? Sure. Can I ask you in uh, which station that was and, and uh, your correspondent? I don't have that from the uh, comment online, so I'm not sure which news station it was. Yes, yeah, so, well, okay. Um, so I'm not, I'm not gonna answer that directly without some context though as to who said that, right? Because I think that that's really important to understand whether it was a journalist and in what context um, and or a commentator or a guest on a, on a show. I just wanna be clear on that one. Um, but I do also wanna, um, I do wanna bring up one thing that I didn't have the opportunity to talk about and that was the media framing, news media framing of certain, uh, you know, uh, critical aspects uh, in this conflict because we've uh, discussed disinformation. Um, then I also uh, talked a bit about um, going beyond disinformation um, and uh, talking about not being able to be inside of Russia and see what is going on and missing a critical piece there. Um, but but one thing um, that was mentioned uh, is the refugee crisis, and I think that there's been uh, much stories, as there should be, about this refugee crisis. Um, and specifically, I mean, this is slated to be um, the largest mass migration in Europe since World War II. And so um, certainly there are stories to tell there, and there should be. Um, but I, I do want to point out, too, that uh, there has been, you know, sort of a sore spot there in terms of how, uh, how Western uh, news media have been sort of portraying um, the, the crisis or the, the, uh, the mass migration crisis that's happening there. Um, and that is sort of offering a comparison between um, a, a very Eurocentric bias and offering a representation of these refugees and pitting them sort of against other country, uh, other refugees in other uh, countries of conflict. And I want to give some examples of that, um, if possible. So, um, you know, some of the things that we've seen uh, journalists say, so for example, um, it's on CBS, a correspondent had said, um, but this isn't a place, with all due respect, like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflict rage raging for decades. This is, quote, relatively civilized, relatively European. And I have to choose those words carefully, too, City, where one you wouldn't expect or hope that this was going to happen. Um, and, you know, places like a UK paper mentioned, war is no longer something visited upon impoverished and remote populations. It can happen to anyone. Um, another news outlet uh, had a, a reporter say, we're not talking about Syrians fleeing the bombing of Syrian re regime backed by Putin. We're talking about Europeans living in cars, leaving in cars that look like ours to save their lives. Um, and so I think that there should be sort of uh, nuances that are sort of taken into perspective here that, um, you know, the, the invasion and the refugee crisis in Ukraine is, is tragic in its own right. And, uh, but journalists don't need to be minimizing other experiences in other countries um, to give what is occurring in Ukraine more gravity. Um, and so uh, the Arab and Middle Eastern Journalists Association actually put out a statement on that, um, you know, that there needs to be sort of the political um, uh, nuances uh, to just prevent sort of prejudicial uh, responses to this crisis. Great. I think we have time the, for... Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Amanda. Uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, in Ukraine, there are um, many Africans and uh, Indian students and workers, but when you see the media, uh, there is no any attention to uh, these uh, uh, citizens from particularly Africa and other um, parts of the world. And also, there are many reporters uh, that um, these uh, uh, Africans have been uh, discriminated and uh, there have been problems to cross into uh, neighboring countries, all these restrictions. So in terms of the media coverage also, uh, it's really uh, lacking some, really giving the whole uh, picture about the refugee crisis. Thank you. Well, we have time for just one more question. Go on. Yeah. Hi. 
I'm Jennifer Dawson. I work here at Endicott College in institutional management. My question for the whole group, I guess, is what, what do we think is Putin's end game? What is his goal here? Let, let's just say, and we hope this doesn't happen, um, he ends up conquering, conquering Ukraine and it becomes back part of the Soviet Union, if that what does he think he wants to do next? Is he trying to conquer all the rest of the other, you know, Belarusia, Georgia, Armenia, um, invade Sweden? Is he trying to expand the Soviet Union and have countries become back in the Soviet Union that used to be, or attack other countries in Europe? W what is really his, his plan? It sounds like a question we can have an hour to answer. It's <coughs> really important. My, <coughs> okay, may, may I start? So I think that what he's been doing is that out of uh, his and his regime's vulnerability, not the imperial ambitions. And, and he stated many times that we're not going to res restore the empire because if so someone who wants to restore the Soviet Union doesn't have a you know, brain, right? So it's like stupid uh, to restore the Soviet Union. Uh, and if you look at, for example, Azerbaijan, which is not, uh, not, uh, which is very smart, and they try to actually go their own way, they improve relationship with Turkey. They even conquered Armenia, who had been the, uh, for a long time the ally of Russia. But uh, after even uh, after the war started, uh, Azerbaijani uh, just talked with Putin and uh, conf confirmed that they would be, uh, you know, maintaining friendly rela relationships. So. So some, I think that if, the, if, you, if you're a smart diplomat, polit, politician, and try in Kazakhstan, they try to actually go their own way, but at the same time kind of maintain a relationship with uh, Russia, I think that would be the best way to preserve their sovereignty, right? And I always tell to my, I remember in 2014, <coughs> there was a delegation of Ukrainian students, I invite them to Endicott, and we spoke, uh, talked a lot about the tensions between Ukraine and Russia. And I said, can we just learn from Taiwan and China? So Taiwan and China have been at odds for a long time, but Taiwan has invested uh, foreign direct investment directly and through Hong Kong, about $200 billion into China. So China has benefited, despite the fact that China considers Taiwan as a and really uh, breakaway region. So I think that it's no, not about the imperial, it's about the establishment of some buffer states around the Russia and so that to prevent uh, them, uh, NATO, from getting into the, like closer to the Russian territory. I think we, we have just one more minute. Can you yep. come and add something? I think the framing of the question is important because it is Putin's war. Mm -hmm. Russia is not Putin, Putin is not Russia. And it is a lot about also, at least from what some of the analysts are saying, his own personal motivation. It's about Russian identity, it's also about his legacy and the legacy that he wants to leave as president or dictator, if you choose to use that word, of Russia. So I think the framing of the question is, is part of the answer. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our panelists for helping us better understand the invasion of Ukraine. And I think our thoughts are with the Ukrainian people who are facing the unthinkable as they live amidst this conflict and continue to fight for their lives, for their freedom, and for their independence. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>